right. Is this shared? I'm going to put the link to the slides in the chat for everybody. So I guess we can get started. Except it says exam two. It's not exam two. It's final exam. But it's final exam final review. Final exam. I will change that. I definitely. I don't know why it says exam two. But yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. So we have some exam info just for you guys, just as a reminder. So the exam is going to be Wednesday, December second to Thursday, December 3rd, from 3 p.m. to 3 p.m., so a full 24 hours to take the exam. And it makes you make sure you want to sit down and find a good amount of time to take the exam, to dedicate towards this. And if you have any questions, feel free to email Professor Francis because she will be watching her email very vigil vigilantly to be able to answer any questions you guys may have. You guys can also reach out to us if you have any questions as well. And then you can also reach out to her if you have a time conflict. Sorry. No, oh, sorry. I was like, I don't know where the button is to click. Now I got it. Okay. All right. And then May's going to take us into the cell cycle. Okay. So we're, we are going to cover the whole cell cycle content that we learned right now. So just as a recap, this is the cell cycle. We're going to start with um, G1 phase. So that's your first growth phase is the start of the cell cycle. Um, the cell is going to prepare for DNA replication. It needs enough nutrients, cell machinery, no mutations. And it's going to commit to the cell cycle at the end of your G1 phase when you have the G1 checkpoint. If it doesn't move on in the cell cycle, then it will go into your G0 phase. That's going to be your non-dividing state, also called quiescence. Um, after you pass the G1 checkpoint, you're going to go into your S phase. S meaning synthesis. That is where your DNA replication is going to happen. Then you're going to have another end of phase checkpoint. Um, your G2 phase, that's going to be your second growth phase, gap growth phase. Um, the cell is going to grow even more. Cells are going to prep for chromosome segregation. And then you're going to have a G2 checkpoint. And then finally, you're going to have M phase before the cycle starts all over again. That is when you're going to have your chromosome segregation. Then we're going to go into the tinier phases within that. And the big one that we're going to focus on is the metaphase checkpoint. All right, now we're going to talk about CDKs. So CDKs are very important when it comes to the cell cycle because they are the cell cycle regulators. So these are usually serine and threonine kinases, and they activate protein complexes that are required for all of the events of the cell cycle to occur. So CDK is regulated by cyclin, and cyclin is constantly being made and degraded in the cell. So as the levels change, that is how the CDKs become active. So it's by phosphorylation or dephosphorylation, but be careful in this case because phosphorylation doesn't necessarily mean activation. And an example of this would be we want. And then CDK inhibitors are also something that regulates CDKs. So in order to activate the CDK, you need activation of phosphorylation and cyclin for it to be completely on and completely active. And anytime you reach a checkpoint, the cell breaks and they're put on an inhibiting or deactivating CDK until it can pass the checkpoint and be able to move on to the next part of the cell cycle. So, yeah, um, as Johan already said, cyclins are required for CDK kinase activity. So you're going to activate your CDK's kinase activity, and it's going to tell CDK what to phosphorylate. Um, cyclin regulation has transcription and translation as specific points that are needed in the cell cycle and ubiquity mediated proteolysis leads to destruction. So as you can see in this picture here, um, different cyclins are going to correspond to different phases of the cell cycle. So this is just a quick example of like cell cycle arrest. 
So the question is, your cell finds a DNA mutation in G1, what happens? So P53 would get activated. So P53, as we talked about before, is a transcription factor and it's a tumor suppressor and it responds to DNA damage. And it activates transcription of P21, which inhibits CDK. So CDK inhibitors are another way that CDKs are regulated in, in the cell and in the cell cycle. So the CDK inhibitor will put a complete break on the cell cycle, so nothing will go on further. And if the damage is irreversible, then the cell will undergo apoptosis. And P53 is highly regulated inside the cell, and it's constantly being degraded if inactive. So now we're going to move on to G1 phase. So as I said earlier, um, G1 phase is the start of the cell cycle. And before cells are going to enter the cell cycle, they need to receive social signals. Uh, that's going to be your growth factor signal since the cell needs to grow. Uh, check for DNA damage. Check for early G1 cyclin. Um, it's cyclin D in this case, but you don't really need to know that. Um, check for that the cell is the right size, that it has the right nutrients, enough nutrients and energy, and it's going to make sure that the pre-RC pre-replication complex is formed. So now we're gonna talk about the G1 formation of the pre-RC. So this begins when activated CDK levels are low in G1, and why is this? Wait, oh, we have a question. Sorry. Yes, P53 is a transcription factor and P21 is made from P53, if that makes sense. Okay, so CDK inhibits the formation of the pre-RC throughout the rest of the cell cycle and there are many spots of origins of replication along our DNA where the pre-replication complex forms, the pre-RC. So these are the different steps to the recruitment. So first, ORC binds to the origin site, and ORC is an ATPase. Well, that means that it's an enzyme because of the whole ACE. And then second, ORC comes and recruits CDC6, which is also an ATPase. And once CDC6 is recruited, it recruits CDT1, which brings the MCM complex, which is a helicase and also an ATPase. So all three of them are ATPases. So once the MCM complex is loaded, the CDT1 dissociates together and this formation is the pre-RC. So as you can see on the picture on the side, it's kind of more clear. This is the complex and then the CDC6 and the CDT1 are recruited in and they form this, and then in comes the MCM complex here, and then from the MCM complex, it goes here, and the CDT dissociates, and this is what forms the entire pre-RC. Yeah, so just to be clear, CDT1 is not part of the complex. Yes, what May said. Okay, so then for G1, or we're going to talk about how CDKs are going to get fully activated. So once you have all that, your cell has all its nutrients, received the growth factor signal, etc., and you formed your pre-RC, which we just went over, we want to know how it transitions into S phase. And this happens first with two main phosphorylation events by two enzymes called CAC and WE1. CAC is going to add an activating phosphate group, and WE1 is going to add an inhibiting phosphate group. So if cyclin CDK has an inhibitory and activating phosphates, it will still be inactive because there's something that is inhibiting that complex. So if we want cyclin CDK to be active, we need to get rid of the inhibitory phosphate. So as you can see from the diagram, it starts with cyclin and CDK separated together, then they come together but that complex is still inactive because there's no activating phosphate on it. The two phosphorylation events happen, but because the inhibitory phosphate is put on, it is still inactive because 
it's still there. So we need to figure out how do we get this inhibitory phosphate off in order for the complex to be active. There was a question in the chat about the significance of the ATPases. And because it has ATPase activity, it means that there are enzymes. And sometimes Laura will ask whether or not a protein is an enzyme. So it's good to be able to distinguish that activity in each of the proteins that we're discussing. Yeah. And um, to continue on what May was saying, the CDC25 will activate the phosphatase and remove the inactivating phosphate. And then that makes CDK completely active. So you can see it here. Here it's inactive. The inhibitory phosphate is here and the activating phosphatase comes and takes off this extra phosphate and then CDK becomes active. Oh, there's another question in the chat, May. It says, is we one not active at the G2M phase checkpoint? Okay, so one second. Wait, before I get to that question, I wanna go back to the ATP is like as Jahan said you just want to make sure that it's an enzyme and then also Laura just sometimes wants you to make sure that you know that enzymes are not using GTP just there's a difference like she wants you to know like if ones are using GTP versus ATP that's kind of a distinction for that um and then we won Can you clarify your question? <laughs> also, like, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there are little boxes. I think it got messed up for the editing, but it's not supposed to say MCDK, it's just CDK. <laughs> yeah, so my question, I just thought that we one was the, like, the protein that was inhibiting the cell cycle from continuing at the end of G2 and not in G1. I thought that G1 was when, um, RB and um, I forget what the other one is, but like I thought we that you know going from G1 to S phase was controlled by RB and not we won. Oh, I see what you're oh. saying. It happens in both. Okay. Yeah. So basically, since you have like that happens, you're right. Um, we're going into that later. Um, basically, it's since um, there are certain there are specific cyclins and CDKs for each phase of the cell cycle. There, this is going to happen multiple times, just okay. for different cyclins. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but it, like the mechanism is basically like the same throughout each. Right. Johan, do you think we're good? To... Oh yeah, I'm good to move on. Yeah. Is this so, you or me? I don't know. <laughs> we, I can do it if you want, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so we activated our CDKs. We um, removed that inhibitory phosphate from we one using CDC25. And then your active CDK is going to phosphorylate a protein RB. Um, phosphorylation of RB causes it to release E2F, which is a transcription factor. So normally without this phosphor phosphorylation event, RB and E2F are bound together. Um, so RB is going to inhibit E2F's activity because it's stuck to it. Um, so once E2F is activated, once the phosphorylation event happens, it can dissociate from RB and it is going to go into the nucleus to promote transcription of proteins for S phase. And the cell is going to pass the restriction point, so that's the point of no return. So also in G G1 phase, there's going to be the pre-initiation complex being formed. So after the pre-RC is assembled, the other proteins are added to create the pre-IC. So this does require the active CDK for formation. So after the pre-IC is formed, the polymerase can be recruited. And once polymerase is recruited, the origin fires DNA replications and S phase can begin. So this is another part that comes together and is required for S phase to begin to continue the cell cycle. So 
So now we're going to move on to S phase. So in S phase, the cell is going to look for DNA damage. P53 activation can happen, as we've seen in the beginning of this phase as well. Um, so you have your SCDKs now, and they're going to inhibit new pre-RCs from forming. And why? Because you only want to replicate DNA once. You don't want to do it more than once in one cycle. Cycle. So S cyclin CDKs, they're going to phosphorylate ORC and prevent association with CDT and CDC6. Um, or they can phosphorylate CDC6 and CD6 that will result in CDC6 degradation, ubiquitin mediated proteolysis, so the MCM complex cannot be recruited. And they can also phosphorylate the MCM27 complex to get exported out of the nucleus. So those are three ways that they're going to inhibit replication from happening a second time in the same place. May, we had another question in the chat. Someone said, is the pre-IC formation after the restriction point? I said yes. yes. Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> so also in S phase continued. So the SCDKs activate in the origin of replication to fire so that replication can start. So they help recruit other proteins like DNA polymerase so that it can latch onto the DNA. And there needs to be a double replication machinery since the replication occurs on either side of the origin of replication. So this is when cohesive rings come in and they form around the replicating DNA. So the rings keep the DNA strands together throughout and after duplication and into M phase as they condense. And this is crucial to make sure that there's an equal number of chromosomes. Because as you know, if there's a wrong number of chromosomes in a cell, it causes problems. So the cohesin rings must represent the S phase in order to function in M phase. So at the end of S phase, you're looking to see if there's no DNA damage and make sure that the DNA was completely and accurately replicated. Now we're going to move on to G2 phase. So in G2 phase, the cell is growing again and is prepping for chromosome segregation. And this phase is extremely important because it's right before cell division occurs and we need to make sure that M phase cyclins are not activated too early because um, that would be before the cell has grown enough. So when the M phase levels are rising but are inactive, they're held inactive by We1. So this is when We1 comes in again, but has to do with a different CDK. And it still acts as an inhibitory kinase that places the inhibitory phosphate on that CDK. And at the same time as this is happening, CAC phosphorylates MCDK with activating kinase. And this kinase is weaker, like a more transient bond than the inhibiting phosphate. So we one and CAC are also both enzymes. So just pay attention and take note of that. So we need the cells to grow big enough so that we can't have MCDK active just yet. AKA we can't prematurely enter M phase if the cell is too small. So if you think this is like May said, this is just when the cell is about to divide. So it needs to be big enough and have enough nutrients to be able to duplicate itself. So then when you get to the G2 end of phase checkpoint, you want to look for, do you have enough resources? Is the cell big enough to divide and there's no DNA damage? So in late G2 phase, so very, very late, almost in M phase, that you can only proceed to M phase when the MCDKs become active. So this is when the MCDK becomes completely active. So the CDC25 is an activating phosphatase and it cleaves off the inhibiting, the inhibiting phosphate off the MCDK. So the MCDK would become active as you see here at the bottom. So then when MCDK is active, it participates in its own positive feedback loop to create its own activity. So it phosphorylates We1 
to inactivate it and phosphorylates more CDC25s. So as more CDC25s are coming in and being activated, then they're coming and they're taking the inhibitory phosphate off of the MCDK so that C MCDK can become active. So now we're moving on to M phase. So M phase overview, you have your prophase, that's when you have your active MCDKs. The nuclear envelope starts to break down and chromosomes are gonna condense. From metaphase, microtubules grow and shrink towards their respective locations, and you're gonna look for proper kinetic core attachments. We'll get into those later. Um, metaphase, chromosomes are gonna align on the metaphase plate, and chromosomes are gonna have proper attachments. Anaphase, separation of duplicated chromosomes, and you have your telophase and cytokinesis. That is when the nuclear envelopes are going to reform, chromosomes are gonna decondense, and the cell is finally going to divide. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into each one of the phases. So prophase. So at this point, the MCDKs are active. So they phosphorylate the lamins to break down the nuclear lamina, aka the nuclear envelope. And then they also phosphorylate the condensin to induce chromosome conden condensation. So it goes from looking like spaghetti to looking like sausages. And then it also has the phosphorylation of various maps and motors to facilitate meiotic spindle assembly, as you can see in the picture here. So we talked a little bit about sequential phosphorylation. Um, this is prominent in a lot of things, especially the cell cycle. So your main idea is phosphorylation needs to happen in a certain order. We've seen this when we went over the pathways where you have the survival signaling pathway when you have protein kinase 1 and protein kinase 2 phosphorylating, AT, phosphorylating AT, AKT. Um, protein kinase 1 has to phosphorylate AKT before protein kinase 2. Um, so as you can see in this diagram, like the phosphorylation happens in a cascade, sort of. So remember, CDKs are master cell cycle regulators. So CDK can act as a priming kinase for downstream kinases. And inhibiting CDK will prevent the cascade and halt the cell cycle. And substrates of PLK1 need to be phosphorylated by CDK in order for PLK1 to bind the substrate. So that's what this diagram is shown here. So CDK, this is your priming phosphorylation, it's gonna phosphorylate the substrate and that allows PLK1 to bind. So now we're gonna talk about spindle assembly and meiotic spindles. So microtubules form a spindle and separate chromosomes during M phase. So there are different types of microtubules so the first type is the aster microtubules, and these grow out from the centrosome and attach to the cell cortex. So in the diagram here, they would be the small like green ones coming out, of the spindle pole. And then there's kinetochore microtubules, and those grow out from the centrosome and attach to the kinetochore. So you can see those would be the blue ones attaching to the kinetochore on the two chromosomes that are aligned in the middle. And then there are also interpolar microtubules and those grow from the centrosome and overlap at the spindle. And these ones can grow and shrink via dynamic instability. So that would be the red or pink microtubules that you see here. So we're gonna talk about the opposing forces from motor proteins. Um, so this plays into spindle formation. Um, so it requires an array of opposing forces and that's with your 
motor proteins or kinesins and dynines. Um, they're going to walk towards opposite ends of the microtubule to create opposing pulling forces that stabilize the spindle. Um, we had the example egg five. That's an example of motor, of motor protein that binds interpolar microtubules. So those are your overlapping ones. Um, this is a special kind of kinesin. It's plus N directed and it will attach to interpolar microtubules kind of like on the top and the bottom um, to help pull the spindle poles together and that stabilizes them. So just a little bit more information about the kinetochore. So the spindle microtubules attach at the kinetochores. So as you can see, it would be like the small little red like humps on the side. So the kinetochore is a complex of many proteins, for example, like MAD, BUB, and CDC20, and it's built at the centromere. And each sister chromatid has a kinetochore attached to it, and the kinetochore microtubules as well. So in metaphase, you have your sister chromatids. They are attached to the kinetochore with microtubules from both spindle poles, and they are secured by cohesin rings, and those are going to line up along the metaphase plate. So for going from metaphase to anaphase, the spindle assembly checkpoint happens, and that ensures that the sister chromatins are aligned and that the spindle is attached properly at the kinetochore. And this will inhibit chromosome segregation unless there are proper microtubule attachments at the kinetochore. So if they're not, then the cell cycle will stop altogether. And then some of the main ideas that you need to know about MAD, BUB, and CDC20 which is this little protein complex here, is that MAD and BUB sense microtubule tension on the kinetochore, and if there's equal tension, then CDC20 is released. So you can see here, the green is the microtubule, and then the orange is the kinetochore. And then since the tension coming from the microtubule is equal on both sides, then CDC20 gets released off. Yeah, but we, we won't really go that deep into that so don't worry about the details of that yeah we don't need to know a lot about the complex just know that this is kind of the background of the spindle assembly checkpoint that like that's why you're able to move on because there's the right tension on the kinetic core but that's it so a little more in depth of the spindle assembly checkpoint um cdc20 from that complex this is kind of like the most relevance it's going to have um, in this course is going to bind um, a protein called APC and activate it. And APC is a ubiquitin ligase. So that means it will target proteins with ubiquitin for degradation. So because APC is active, it's going to target the protein securin for degradation. Um, so that's over here. And securin is normally bound to another protein called separase at this point. Um, we've seen this kind of like scenario with multiple other different proteins. We, um, it's similar to the bad BCL2 um, scenario when securin is bound to separase. Separase can't do its job. We talked about it a little earlier with like the E2F and RB. We're talking about another protein binding to another protein and then inhibiting a protein's function, that sort of thing. So APC, oh, sorry, what is this? Okay, then APC is also going to, also um, targets M-cyclin when it's active. So M-cyclin CDK activity is going to drop at the beginning of anaphase. So because APC targets securin for degradation, securin is going to be degraded degraded. And since securin is then gone, separase is going to be active. Um, active separase's job is to cleave the cohesin rings around the sister chromatids. So once those are cleaved, the sister chromatids are going to separate. And that is when you pass this checkpoint and you're going to move on from metaphase to anaphase. So now we're at anaphase, and anaphase is kind of split into two sections, so anaphase A and anaphase B. So during anaphase A, the chromosomes are pulled towards the poles, and the force generated at the kinetochore will move the chromosomes. So as you can see in the picture here, like 
the kinetochores are attached to the microtubules and that tension will cause them to separate. And then the kinetochore microtubules will shorten and the poles will stay in place. And then after that anaphase B, the poles will be pushed away and pulled apart and the sliding force between the interpolar microtubules from opposite poles and pulling the force directly on the poles to pull them apart. That's a lot of poles. Uh, the microtubule growth is at the positive end. So as you can see in this picture here, those interpolar microtubules are being shortened going towards this at the centrosome here, and then they're being pulled apart. And this would be it as a result. I feel like you cut out during that, but it might have been like my Wi-Fi. It also cut out for me. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or is it pretty straightforward? Right, is there, is there something I should like go over? All right, I think we can keep the train rolling. All right, all right. So then we've reached telophase and cytokinesis. So your sister chromatids have reached opposite poles. Um, there's what your what's called a cleavage furrow um, that's created by the contractile ring right here, um, and it's an indentation in the cell's membrane that gradually deepens until it hits the spindle that is left between the two nuclei and it eventually splits. So it starts to separate into two cells. Um, so since M-cyclin CDK activity has dropped, as we saw when um, APC targets M-cyclin, um, the spindle is going to break down, nuclear envelopes are going to form around the DNA, and chromosomes are going to uncoil to form chromatin. So the sausages that we saw earlier that condensed are going to now go back into their spaghetti-like state. Um, and this allows for immediate use in metabolic processes. So just to conclude, a couple of the main ideas for the cell cycle. So one, the cell cycle events happen in a particular order. And it's always important to know what that order is. So the second thing is the cell cycle events involve cyclical activation and deactivation of proteins like cyclins and CDKs. And often it means by phosphorylation with fresh ATP. So most of the proteins are ATPases as a result. And the third thing is CDK must be bound to cyclin in order to be active. Fourth, CDK regulates particular proteins in different phases of the cell cycle. And different phases of the cell cycle have their own cyclins. Each cyclin is created, degraded, and degraded in a particular part or phase of the cell cycle. And last, regulation for proper functioning requires activation, deactivation, and inhibition. And don't think of them as positive or negative or one or the other. Yeah, so a big thing, that was our last slide, but a big thing um, is no details of regulation like regulation includes something being activated and deactivated and having it be active or inactive for the right period of time in order to get the particular amount of something, proteins, that a cell could need. It's all catered to what the cell needs, um, but yeah. Nothing also, is try to use like as much specific language as you can. Like, if you say that something is being activated, like say how it's being activated, like via phosphorylation or dephosphorylation, or whether if something is bound to it and it's inhibiting it, say like something is phosphorylating that inhibitor, causing it to be released. Like, just try to be as specific as possible. Yeah, I'm sure you all do great. Right, it'll be, it'll be fine. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Do you guys know what time the review session is tomorrow? I am unsure, but me and Syed are gonna send out an email later to let you guys know. It will probably be around the same time as this one though, like 4.30, 5 o'clock. Yeah, good luck, good we'll all do great. Feel free to reach out. Right, good luck everyone. That will be on all new material. 
it should be. It should be on um, anything that we haven't covered yet in the review sessions. Right, it's all the uh, week 13. Week 13, week 12, something like that. Because me, well, me and Syed already did a review with some of the week 13, with like the beginning of the week 13 stuff. But I don't know if somebody did one on Friday with the rest of it. You're welcome. Good luck, guys. You know, like, it's tough this whole semester, honestly. Yeah, it's always rough. Do you want to stop the recording? Oh, right. Thank you for reminding.